Um, thank you so much. So uh, super quick intro on myself. Hi, I'm Jeff Allen, uh, co-founder of the Integrity Institute uh, and acting as chief research officer there. Um, just very quick background. So by training, I'm actually a physicist, uh, but I left physics and academia about 10 years ago uh, to get into the tech world where I am a data scientist by trade. Um, you know, spend some time on the publishing side of the internet, spend some time on the platform side, uh, but the past year has been all about the Integrity Institute. Uh, I'm really, really excited about our panel here, and um, I want to say we actually got a really great setup. So Peter in the first panel mentioned how companies are not sort of well-defined concepts, right? Companies are actually groups of people, uh, people who are making decisions and have their own incentive structures internally um, and, are, and are working that way. Uh, Natalie, I believe, mentioned that the users of platforms are also not monolithic, right? There's users, there's customers, they, they're different, right? They have different concerns. Um, and I'm really excited that on our panel, we have people who can speak to all of those um, and all of the different sort of spheres of influence uh, that, that can help make decisions here. Um, so yeah, I wanna give everyone a, a quick opportunity to introduce themselves and their organization, uh, starting with David. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm David Sullivan with the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership, um, which has been shouted out a couple times uh, already uh, today. Um, so we are a group of uh, 12 companies and growing um, that have committed uh, to a uh, articulating and evolving a set of practices, uh, best practices framework for trust and safety um, that's geared around processes as opposed to specific types of content. Uh, and so uh, we have a set of best practices with five overarching commitments for companies to take trust and safety seriously and dedicate resources to it across product development, uh, governance, enforcement, improvement, and transparency with an underlying set of 35 practices that support those uh, commitments. Uh, and we are pioneering a set of uh, assessments, first uh, internal assessments, and then third party assessments of those practices um, that we help can sort of show more about how companies are doing trust and safety across a wide array of different types of products and services, different business models um, that we hope can be a kind of common industry contribution uh, to this global conversation uh, about uh, uh, content governance. I'm Charlotte Wilner. I'm executive director at the Trust and Safety Professional Association, or TSPA. Uh, I am a risk mitigation professional by training with an asthmatic three-year-old. So thank you for your forbearance with my attire here. It's my best fashion. Um, TSPA is building a community of practice for people who work in what we would consider online trust and safety broadly. So that is everybody who is engaged in the work of online trust and safety from frontline moderators to the people who write those policies to the people who maybe defend those policies in various contexts. Um, that is the data scientists, that is the quality assurance professionals all the way up to the C-suite. Um, we believe that one of the best ways that we can keep people doing a good job and keep them in the field doing a good job is giving them a community of support. And so we do that through uh, educational trainings, we do that through professional development services, and we really do that by fostering a, a community of dialogue so people can come together, understand who each other are, meet people sort of at their various stages in their journey, and sort of go forward with that to, to apply to their own practice. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. I co-run uh, Check My Ads. We are a nonprofit institute that uncovers the relationship between ad tech companies and the publishers of disinformation and hate speech with whom they do business. We have defined something called the disinformation economy. It's the economy that has radicalized so many people into an alternative reality. And when I say disinformation economy, a lot of people, they think of Facebook because Facebook has amplified incredible amounts of disinformation and information that has othered many minority groups. But Facebook is not where disinformation makes money. The ads on Facebook only serve to employ em uh, employees of Facebook. The practitioners of dis disinformation make money when users of Facebook go to their websites where dozens of ad exchanges are waiting to serve them ads. This is a $700 billion industry 
and it has no watchdog until four months ago when we launched. So that's what we do. We are uh, marketers by trade. I also have a master's in geography and a certificate in international election observation from the Global Campus for Human Rights. I care a lot about democracy and I am alarmed by how my marketing tech stack is being used to make society a more unsafe place. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and so we're really, uh, really excited to have this group here um, to represent, like I love, you know, hearing about best practices. I love hearing about the, the profession and building a career and the health, staying healthy, like while that career is being built. Um, and also to hear about like the economy of it, right? Because there is an incentive structure here, right? And people follow incentive structures. Um, so it's really important to make sure that we have the right one. Um, I'd love for you all to talk about uh, roughly like the theory of change of your organization, right? What is the vision that you, you view yourself as building towards? Um, and, and what is the role that you see your organization uh, towards that goal, building towards it? We going in that order again? What are we doing here? Uh, you spoke much. first, you go for oh, it. Gosh. Well, um, so I mentioned we are building a community of practice. And what that means to me is actually I'll take you on a personal journey. Uh, I started in trust and safety about 15 years ago now and was uh, then Facebook's first safety manager. And so that started you know, sort of 2009, 2010. It was just me and a team of 10 other folks. And we needed to kind of figure a lot out. And I had this moment where they were coming to me and saying, you know, we're seeing some weird stuff. Like, yeah, I bet you are. And uh, I called our, our employee assistance program and said, uh, you know, I've got this team and they're sort of exposed to this stuff at work. They're like, what are you talking about? They sent someone out who was like, listen, maybe just cut your caffeine and we're going to just darken the room and listen to whale noises. And I was sitting in this room, listening to the whale noises with my team, thinking a lot about my credibility as a manager. But in that moment, I really just wanted to talk to somebody else who had my job, right? Who had done that before and would be able to say like, you know, save the whales, but also what you might want is some cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever it is. And that for me is sort of the, the origin of my journey with TSPA all these years later. We are here to connect people to other people who are having their experiences. And that's true with the content, right? Which as we've said many times here, changes daily, changes by the moment. Um, but that's true with the practice, right? Um, the more we can learn from each other how not to make certain mistakes and how to at least make our own individual better mistakes, uh, we think that is fundamentally really, really powerful in terms of helping all of us move faster and move better together. So I can build on that maybe just to say, I think like to create the enabling environment within the organizations where the professionals that, uh, that Charlotte is working with uh, to be able to succeed, there is a need for um, uh, digital services as an industry to come together and say, there are certain commitments and certain practices um, that we all commit to, even if the types of services that we provide uh, are incredibly different, whether it is services that are ad-based, whether it is subscription-based, whether it's e-commerce, um, there's a lot of different types of business models, a lot of different types of content that are going to present real risks to the safety and the rights of users of those services. Uh, and uh, we need an approach that can um, uh, be agnostic to those particular types of content because we are all not even going to agree in this room, let alone within uh, you know this country, let alone across industry or around the world about what types of content should not be allowed on certain types of services. But we can agree that if there are a set of practices uh, that companies commit to that can allow them to do this work better, that that's going to improve the, the quality of our online experience while preserving the diversity of different types of services and the values that they provide in terms of economic benefits and expressive benefits and all sorts of other benefits. Um, so that's what we're coming together around, I, I think. And um, so th th I think that's where we're, we're going. Our theory of change is that advertisers don't want to sponsor hate speech or disinformation. We know this, it's called brand safety. It's the practice of making sure that your ads are associating with publishers, AKA websites, that adhere to the same kind of standards that you would expect your employees to adhere to when you work. 
It works. We believe in free markets. We believe in the free speech of advertisers to stay the hell away from the things that are dangerous to their employees, their communities, and their families. And so what we do is we have a newsletter. It's called Branded. You can find it at checkmyads.org slash branded. And it goes out to 10,000 or so industry association people, people who work at Fortune 500 companies, people who work in ad tech, and every two weeks, we publish stories about ad tech companies who are working with the kinds of websites that make the VP of marketing say things like, oh my God. And we've seen it over and over again. Before we had the Institute, we had an agency and we helped Fortune 500 companies set brand safety guidelines, that is, delineate what is and is not appropriate use of their ad spend so that they could give that to their media agency and the media agency could give that to their demand side provider ad exchange. And the demand side provider would use that document to then say to their SSP supply side provider ad exchanges, don't send ads to places that do not adhere to these brand safety guidelines. And what we found in this process is that it was actually very hard for Fortune 500 companies to stay on top of where their ad campaigns were going because there is an information asymmetry within this market. It's also called a lemon market. If you think of cars when you buy a lemon, it's very hard for advertisers to tell when, they, when parts of their campaign are good for them and when parts of their campaign are bad for them. And that's because ad tech has taken an incredible amount of power away from marketers. They've said, don't worry, we'll keep your brand safe and we'll give you scale and we'll give you high uh, visibility, click-through rates, impressions, and low CPMs, that is cost per thousand views. Don't worry about it, we'll keep your brand safe in the meantime. And the fact is, is that they're lying and they're not doing that. So we have a $700 billion industry with two incredibly aligned incentives on the side of the public we want to live in a safe community with safe people and safe neighbors and advertisers who don't want anything to do with the people who make those neighborhoods unsafe, which is incredible because at that point, we're dealing with a free market conversation and a free speech conversation, one that I'm happy to uphold as someone who otherwise is more leftist. Yeah, and um, all these actually really align with like what we've been trying to do at the Integrity Institute as well. Um, one thing that we see is that, you know, there's a lot of different companies in the space. There's a lot of different advertisers in the space. They've all been trying different things um, and they've seen different results as of what they've tried, uh, as of what they've tried. Um, and there's a like, real opportunity, right, to bring these people who have, you know, tried different, you know, techniques uh, to improve the situation together to sort of share that knowledge, right? And um, it's something that in the at the Integrity Institute, we believe that like all companies win, right? When all companies are following better practices uh, and this is taken more seriously. Um, I would not be at all surprised if all, all advertisers win when the online ad space is safer. That is probably true. Um, and so just really exciting to like have all these orgs, you know, thinking about this space. Um, so would also love to, to go deeper on that. So where ha, what's an example um, of where you think your org has had success in moving towards uh, the, the vision that you're trying to achieve? Uh, and I think we'll start with Claire. Well, we've taken millions of dollars out of the disinformation economy. Our playbook works. What we do is address where ad tech companies have lied and they don't want to be seen as liars because this is an incredibly opaque industry and it relies incredibly on trust and relationships. So when they're caught saying things that are not true, they fix the problem very quickly. We have a campaign going right now, it's called Defund the Insurrectionists, and we identified the six people who have made the most money off of election disinformation, that is, anything to do with the big lie that led up to a violent insurrection on Capitol Hill. These people are Dan Bongino, Steve Bannon, Charlie Kirk, Tim Poole, Glenn Beck, and already four of them have been almost entirely demonetized by this campaign. That is, Google dropped them, Playwire dropped them, Gum Gum dropped them, Magnite dropped them. These are all names of ad tech companies who I would like to be household names if they don't clean up their act. Thank you for asking. 
I was so I was so taken with this answer. I almost forgot the question. I was like, oh, right. Oh, I'm on this panel. So, oh, okay. Um, I mean, first of all, in terms of the, the success we've seen, uh, I'll say it's just a bold choice to launch a networking association in a pandemic. Uh, you know, so we're here and that's great. Um, I, I think I was really struck by the prior panelists on actually the last, the last two sessions talking about just trust and the role of trust in, in our broader ecosystem and building those relationships of trust is a big part of what we do. And so I'd say looking at sort of the almost two years we've been in existence, I think the most magical piece of, of watching that unfold has been watching those different professionals who maybe historically were not together because they, they worked at sort of rival companies. They were maybe even sort of incentivized not to be in communion with each other. Um, really starting to build those relationships of trust. Uh, last year, we launched our first couple chapters of our trust and safety curriculum, which is all about under, like explaining what is trust and safety, what is the practice of trust and safety, and not here's what you should do and what you shouldn't do, but like here are the kinds of things you wanna think about when you're setting up. And that's been just really useful to people getting started for the first time. And that's all volunteer written by this community. Uh, we, this last few weeks have been launching our project groups for this year, and it's things like, uh, global compensation transparency, right? There's volunteers coming and saying, yeah, you know, we do want to know what we're getting paid and we want to be sure we're paying people right, you know? And that's all something that our volunteers are making that time for. And it's those types of conversations you can only have if you have that trust in the room. And so something I think we're looking forward to coming out of projects like that is building trust, obviously, not just within our community, but between our community and these other stakeholders who we've been hearing from today. And I've just really appreciated that that lens so many of you have used. So in our case, um, I think uh, I mentioned uh, DTSP launched uh, about a year ago uh, with this best practices framework and this set of commitments uh, and getting uh, you know, a, a growing number of companies to agree to that uh, and to make a public commitment to that is something. What we didn't know until actually we did a sort of initial baseline survey um, uh, towards the end of last year is how many of these practice of these 35 practices we've identified across these five commitments are companies actually using? Are there phantom commitments that sort of everybody was like, oh yeah, that sounds good, but but nobody's using them? And uh, we found as an initial starter that all of our uh, members uh, at the time were using 80% uh, uh, of those 35 practices. Now that is just the very beginning because uh, where it gets interesting is that folks inside companies at, at this moment are doing these self-assessments um, to look at those practices and assess their maturity and identify risks and controls to address those risks. And they're having difficult conversations inside companies when the people who are working on trust and safety policy are going to the product teams and saying, hey, tell me more about how you actually document what you do here. Um, and, and so there's a lot more to come in terms of what that's gonna look like and being able to share a kind of state of the industry report that looks at how these practices are being used and how they can be improved um, without saying that Google is doing this and Microsoft is doing that. Um, but the fact that that we have so so many companies who are who are using the same practices because that there is a discipline here um, that, that we can put an envelope around um, I think is something that I, I'm really excited about. Yeah, I think at the Integrity Institute, you know, I also want to like touch on the the the, the trust um, sort of theme, right? And like the the idea that there is a trust gap, right, between the companies and between the policymakers. And um, you know, it has existed for you know historical purposes, for legacy purposes, but it isn't necessarily in the company's own best interest for there to have this trust gap. Um, and I think the Integrity Institute, one of the things I'm most proud of is our ability to sort of find our niche there and, and fill that in and sort of like fill in the uncertainties, um, which also goes to the best practices, right? Because there are companies that are doing good things here and they do deserve credit, right? And the more we can give credit to companies when they do the right thing uh, and when they make the right decisions and when they change how they make decisions, um, the more, again, like everybody wins, right? We policymakers can make better decisions with better, you know, transparency and better data and, and companies get credit and are, you know, incentivized to do the right thing. Um, so going from uh, successes, what are some of the challenges in this space? So obviously, um, you know, it's a very, it's a fairly clear line to power that like the companies have, right? Companies can, can you know, decision makers and leaders of companies can change how the company works overnight. Um, policymakers, right? Obviously creating policy is, is, is a whole process and it takes time, but you know, regulation has a very fairly clear path to impact. 
Um, so what are some of the challenges of not having these direct lines uh, uh, towards changing how the system works um, that your organization has faced? Uh, and start with you, Charlotte. That's a great question. On, yeah, all right. Um, this is a great question. I, I think I've, I'm thinking about it, I guess, in, in this way. Something I've been most struck by in my job, I mean, frankly, is that I get to talk to anybody, right? Because I mean, 15 years in trust and safety, they don't typically put you out there first line. Um, the conversations I have had, to, I've, I've gotten to participate in, and the or, our organization has gotten to participate in around just illustrating like what this is like behind the scenes have been so illuminating. And I think one of the challenges that actually, frankly, a lot of you have identified already is like, we just don't have a very clear picture of what's going on in there, right? And there are historical reasons for that. There are just frankly operational reasons for that. Cause like, you know, yet you have to know what's going on before you explain it to anybody. Um, but I think where, where we've seen a lot of opportunity and a lot of enthusiasm, not just from people outside the companies, but inside the companies themselves is having people out there, like perhaps the Integrity Institute, TSBA, whoever it is, everybody here um, is helping the public understand these human systems, right? Because that's what these are, even if it's a robot, like a human trained that robot, right? And there's so much potential, I think, for that human dialogue. I think we, we reach a better place altogether if we are able to have those real and honest conversations about like, okay, but this is, it's like a lot of dental floss and bubble gum back here or whatever it is, right? Um, I think that has been, I think one of the great challenges that we're facing and, and one of the great opportunities. Um, so as an industry initiative that is doing both self and then third party assessments uh, in an era where the talking point, whether it's among politicians or pundits or whatnot, that the era of self-regulation is over, that is a challenge. Um, however, I would say it's not so much that the era of self-regulation is over, it's that the era of no regulation is over. We've heard from, from policymakers uh, and regulators in the first panel of the, the things that are coming. And I think that there are conversations happening inside companies to be like, we are going to be a regulated industry in many ways. We have a chance to get ahead of that and to sort of uh, understand how what we do to actually like, you know, enforce our policies and keep people safe on our services um, can interoperate with the kinds of regulations that are coming in Europe, in the UK, in, in dozens of countries around the world. Um, that are considering these things right now. Um, and this is why you can't, it can't just be the companies. And that's why our, our vision is to create a third party assessment process where outside experts who know things about assessments and audits and assurance, but also know things about safety uh, and, and know things about how to, the, the, the substantive matter at, at hand, not just a checkbox, um, how all that can work together um, to give uh, a global industry a sort of um, touch point with, uh, with regulators, with civil society organizations and human rights groups um, who are all trying to, to figure out how to get companies to do a better job here. No challenges. <laughs> the first challenge that we have is drawing a line between what is and is not appropriate use of ad campaign money. And every single Fortune 500 representative that I have spoken to says, we are seriously concerned with the disinformation crisis that we see today. We know that local news is being defunded en masse. We know that disinformation is making millions, but how do we do this within the corporate structure where we want to be fair to both sides? And every single conversation we have starts with that question. And we have to work time and time again to reframe the issue and to say, this is not a question of being fair to both sides. That is strategically weak. To be in the middle of two parties where one party can suddenly act in bad faith and pull the middle is to not have character or brand. And so what we say instead is reframe it. It's not left versus right. This is journalistic standards or at least an adherence to reality versus disinformation and othering of people. And as soon as we reframe it, it's like all of a sudden it becomes easy, but we can't keep having that conversation over and over again with one 
in one advertiser at a time. So that's why we made a nonprofit instead of a for-profit. We're not here to, to consult anymore. We need bigger scale. We need everyone to understand within our industry how to frame the issue. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that nobody understands ad tech. <laughs> ad tech is intentionally opaque. It is opaque by design. They are making incredible amounts of money off the backs of publishers, including local news publishers. The kinds of research that we have found would make your skin crawl for how much they take versus how much they give per CPM to publishers. We're talking in the 90% they keep. We are in a disinformation crisis because ad tech has been serving themselves for years. So what we're doing is we're bringing ad tech to the people. We're helping everyone to understand how it works and what their rights are. At South by Southwest last week, we spoke to a room of about 300 marketers and we said, reject the defaults, don't accept them. Please check your ads, ask for your campaign information and don't accept the high level reports. If you're optimizing for low CPMs, low cost per thousand impressions, you're going to have a bunch of junk websites in your campaign. It doesn't make any sense. So why are you letting them dictate the metrics by which you measure your own success? Instead, we need to think about brand, about who we associate with. And these are radical ideas. I'm seeing people nodding, but in the marketing world, they're like, oh yeah, that thing we used to do 20 years ago. Ad tech has totally co-opted the conversation and I see it as a power struggle between advertisers and marketers and these technologists. And I think that's an exciting power struggle because what it does do is allow us to be incredibly compassionate to our friends and family members who are susceptible to disinformation. We are not fighting them. We are fighting the people who are paying to radicalize others, which is a whole other a whole other conversation that is also one that I struggle with sometimes because we're talking about the places that are not a gray area. And so one of, my, one of the struggles at Check My Ants that we're always trying to bring people back to, this is a question of money. This is not a question of beliefs. This is not a question of, you know, my aunt believes this and are you cancel culture? We're not talking about that. It's just business. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um... You know, a lot of a lot of the challenges that we're sort of all talking about is also just catching up to the demand, right? I think um, you know it was said earlier that you know trust and safety is is something of a new uh, field within the discipline, and I think that's definitely not the case, right? Like people were sort of like thinking about these issues. Maybe maybe it wasn't named trust and safety, but um, people were, have been thinking about these issues since the the birth of the internet. Um, and I can point you to papers in 1996 that were talking about like incentive structures of platforms and, and all these things. So, so people have been out there and thinking about it, but you know, society is just realizing that there's this huge need for society to grapple with this as a whole. And, and yeah, like we're, we're catching up with like, oh, is our code actually documented on how this works, right? And like, are we actually on top of all the definitions of bad content? Um, you know, do we actually like fully understand like the full scope and like what actually is harmful content and then what is the full spectrum of it? Um, you know, and just catching up to like all the different things that different companies have tried. Um, and so really, I think, you know, the challenge on a lot of our orgs in the space C is just catching up to the demand, right? Policymakers have demands for us this, uh, this space, you know, academics have it, you know, companies old and new, right? Like have their, their demands internally. Um, you know, you're having to educate different marketers about like, yeah, like here's what content looks like on the internet nowadays, right? There's just so much, so much to catch up with uh, on, on outside stakeholders. Um, so, so on that note, what is, uh, what is an opportunity uh, for uh, uh, an external organization, uh, one of the different stakeholders in this field um, that you sort of like see opportunity and, and possibility for your organization to, to work with? Uh, we'll start with David. So uh, for other stakeholders to work with our organizations that just I just have to make us like, pick a favorite here? Like, <laughs> uh, not necessarily like a, a an organist you don't have to name an organization but you can name like a type of stakeholder that is out there that that you think um or you see opportunity for you you know DTSP and another organization to work together yeah 
No, so we just uh, did a series of virtual consultations where we managed to get about 120 people. How many of them were multitasking on Zoom? I will not uh, now question, but there was uh, you know, very robust conversation with folks from 27 different countries around the world um, talking through this approach to best practices and assessment that we're doing. And I wanna continue those conversations because as an industry organization, it's essential that we are out there talking to uh, all of the stakeholders who are affected by this. And when you're talking about products and services used by billions of people, that's kind of a everyone, um, which is, is a is problematically uh, problem of scale. Uh, that said, I think that, you know, we, we've heard on a, a previous panel about challenges around different types of stakeholder engagement mechanisms, whether that is, you know, advisory councils or whatnot, and, and the opportunity for creative thinking there. My approach has been, let's just get out there and talk to everyone and then we'll figure out the structure that works best uh, you know ultimately we need to have these kinds of the points of interaction and communication whether it's with government law enforcement with it, whether it's with civil society groups who are you know running the gamut from digital rights to to child safety um you know we're just trying to get out there talk to all of those folks and show them how this kind of industry approach is essential to be part of the solution. It's not going to, you know, you you need to have uh, in, incredibly important roles for government policymakers who are, you know, moving ahead in many places around the world. Even if what's happening here in the United States is is a little bit more tenuous. Uh, um, so um, I think that's that's where we see the opportunity to to engage with folks. I'm going to give you another personal story here. Um, but I promise it's relevant. So I was an English major. And uh, of course, the English major prepares you for many career paths as is well established. Um, but I mean it because actually when people when students ask me now, like, you know, how, how did an English degree prepare you? I said, well, you get more reading assigned than you can do. So you need to figure out which parts of it you do. And you got to be real confident with that choice. You got to go with it. And the same is true in working on online trust and safety. You cannot know all of it, right? But you kind of need to know a little bit of a lot of it to be able to do your job. And like machines help with this at a certain point, but fundamentally it's that human decider who needs to be able to have the inputs they, they, they require to make those good choices. And so this question of like engagement and like what is useful, something we really, I, I'm messing up your order because now I'm gonna talk about my challenge. We were like, like three, three questions ago. One of the challenges we have is how do we get all the information that your sorts of organizations are working on in a way that is then easily digestible and metabolizable by our professionals, right? And the better conversations we are as an association able to have with all of these stakeholders, whether that's government, civil society, whatever it is, we try to do it then our job of making that accessible for people who you know, they want to know all this stuff, but they also have this day job where they got to make a lot of decisions every 10 seconds, or they have to, you know, write this policy, something's on fire, whatever it is, right? Um, so that's the type of engagement we really like to do. And similarly, we like to be able to, you know, answer the questions that you have about trust and safety. Um, and they are many, and we all have them, but, you know, the more in dialogue we can be sort of group to group, I think we end up with these better outcomes. Could I ask just who's in regulation? Just so I can see, thank you so much. Okay, so I am not in regulation, but I, I believe in regulation. And I'm going to say, I'm just gonna get technical just for a second, bear with me. My apologies, there are two types, large scale, okay, big brush strokes. There's two types of ad exchange companies that work in this digital supply chain that get ads to websites. There's the kind of ad exchange that brings the advertisers to market. They're called demand side providers or DSPs. And there's fewer of them, they're really big. And then there's the supply side providers. They bring the, the publishers or the websites to market. They're the SSPs or the supply side providers. Okay, so there's two types. They bring advertisers or they bring publishers. And this would be simple if that's all they did. But the supply side providers are also bundling publishers. And sometimes they have direct relationships with the publishers and sometimes they're reselling other people's direct relationships with publishers. And sometimes they're selling bundles of other people's publishers. Yeah, you're laughing. It's hilarious. What a mess. And this is a huge problem because when you're trying to check your ads and you're trying to find out where your campaign went, you cannot see it. 
you just see the domain sometimes, but there's three things that are trafficked on the digital supply chain. Ads, of course, the literal physical, physical 2D ads that you see on the website, the creative. Money, of course, which is how disinformation operations can sustain and grow their operations. Before Breitbart was demonetized, they were going to expand to France and Germany, and they couldn't because they lost their $8 million dollars of projected revenue for the following year. Okay, so ads and money. The third thing which should give you shivers is the personal identifiable information of all people, anyone on the internet. Now imagine you're running a propaganda outfit. It's not just beneficial to pump out the narratives that help your boss. It's also incredibly valuable to get money and data. And it's not just the publishers that we're talking about, it's the SSPs, there are hundreds of them. These are the, these are the supply side providers, the companies who work within the ad tech stack, who bring publishers to market. We don't know who owns all of the SSPs. We cannot see the beneficial owners of these companies. These are companies that are not just American, they're Russian, they're Chinese, they're all kinds of national security nightmares. And we need help understanding where our ads are going and who the beneficial owners are of these companies. If you are in regulation, please pay attention to the digital supply chain. Thank you. All right, I think um, one last question. Okay, a sort of a, a, a bonus one inspired actually uh, by you, Charlotte. So you talked about how your degree in English actually comes in handy uh, in the trust and safety space now. And I think um, it really is an interesting field within technology that requires a different set of skills that, that people don't traditionally have and, and maybe people aren't getting in their education uh, as, they, as they go into toward sort of like the standard degrees that lead you into the tech field. Um, so one sort of question is, uh, what are some of the skills that you see being crucial to operating in the trust and safety space um, or this new digital, you know, sort of like ecosystem um, that you think people aren't getting trained? And so uh, Claire, maybe focus on like the, the marketing aspect. So if you have a degree in marketing, you know, what are, what are the sort of what is being left out of that degree, right, that you need to, to, to have to operate? Um, what's going into the best practices that people aren't learning in their computer science degrees or design degrees? Um, yeah, and start with you, Claire. I don't have a degree in marketing. Oh. In the marketing industry, we have to learn how to draw a line. We have to learn how to stand up for our brands. We have to learn what marketing is. Right now, the biggest best practice is to spend 90% of your campaigns on Facebook. And that's incredibly uncreative. That is not what marketers were made to do. We are made to be creative and excited and artful. I believe in the industry of marketing and brand. I think it's part of a, of a lively industry. I think it's part of a lively way of living that we have ads in the world. I know that they can be annoying, but I do believe in them, generally speaking. And right now, I think that it's been co-opted. And I mean, everything I've said Everything I have to say, I've said before, I think marketers need to take back control of their ad campaigns. Some folks have heard me say this before and I apologize for the repetition, but um, trust and safety is often abbreviated to TNS. Um, but I joke that it is uh, actually, it stands for uh, trade-offs and sadness. Um, <laughs> and I promise, uh, the thing that people need to be prepared for in this job is knowing how to make trade-offs. Right, like if if there were a clear answer all the time, we'd be doing it already, you know. And in fact, what you usually have is a bunch of decisions, all of which are not ideal. And then you feel sad, right? And your executives feel sad, and your team feels sad, and the public feels sad. But that doesn't change those choices in front of you, right? And so, any training that people can receive either before they come into the field or in the field, though they get plenty of on the job training real fast, it about understanding what trade-offs to do and understanding the real world impacts you're dealing with with those trade-offs. That is the number one skill set in this field. 
I couldn't agree more with that. <laughs> My degree is in international relations and conflict management, which definitely oh, comes boy, in handy there you go. In, the, in the trust and safety space. Um, what I will say is that uh, when I was doing human rights advocacy uh, and trying to prevent mass atrocities in a lot of places around the world, um, we worked, we campaigned with companies to work on supply chains. Um, we got legislation passed um, and we were affirmatively trying to make things happen uh, on Capitol Hill, with the executive branch, with governments around the world. Um, when I joined, the, came into the internet policy realm uh, at, at the Global Network Initiative, where my colleague Jason was speaking earlier, um, someone told me, no, 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 we try to keep bad things, like keep people from doing bad things with legislation in this space. And that oftentimes our victories were we slowed <laughs> the pace of something bad from happening so less bad things happen. Uh, and um, so I think that um, understanding, yeah, the, the gravity of the challenge, but that, you know, that there is nonetheless an incredible amount that we can do when companies get together, when uh, those companies are working with, with, with like-minded uh, governments, civil society organizations, human rights groups. Uh, and I, I think the thing I would end on from that I hope I learned in my degree in international relations was to have some sort of respect for cultural con context uh, and understanding the, the nuances of how these things play out in many different places around the world. Uh, and I, I would say that I think this conversation, these conversations we've had today have been incredibly valuable. It's been a joy to be back here in a room with so many people to have them, um, but we need to have them with a lot more people from a lot more places who are underrepresented in this room uh, and in conversations going on uh, uh, around the globe. Uh, so that's the next step. And I look forward to uh, talking to Chris about how we can do this in like, you know, 10 different countries <laughs> on every continent around the world. Thank you. And thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, let's give them a round of applause and we'll move on to the next.